Okay, so uh, so first of all, we delivered by uh, Simon Saunders uh, about advanced interpretation. This is a shortcut. <laughs> I, I should not tell you to go. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so my thanks to the organizers. This is a lovely conference. It's a lovely atmosphere and so forth. So um, I'm going to actually tell you the whole of my talk in a single sentence, I think, which is that um, you uh, define branches in a great sense in terms of decoherence theory, and you choose which ones you can. Yes. Is, is it is working, isn't it? Yes. 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 All right, sorry. Uh, and you choose uh, these branches to have equal amplitudes, uh, which you always do. Um, then uh, the Born rule follows just from the relative frequencies of outcomes. So it's a very, very simple minded analysis of what probability is. Um, and I think that's its main strength. Anyway, so let me go through. Um, oh, so I wonder if I already done this one. I'm sorry, I had to put the dice up. I couldn't resist. Um, I'm sure this has happened repeatedly in the previous ones. But um, okay. Uh, so um, what I mean by uh, decoherence-based effort interpretation is what's spelled out in these books. Um, it, it was fairly foreign to uh, the literature on the effort interpretation uh, well into the 90s. So, and I think most people took a look at Everett's work in the 70s and 80s, particularly following Dewitt, uh, and I think dismissed it for very good reasons. But I do think decoherence theory rather changes the picture. So let me just try to say why. Um, one of them, and this relates to... Really? Yes. <laughs> uh, one of them relates to uh, classical concepts uh, being derived rather than assumed. I don't know if people know Ballantyne's uh, paper of 73, the famous critique really of the Everett interpretation, making this point. Um, and Everett did not address it. Of course, Everett never wrote again after 57. But the DeWitt did not address it. Strangely, I think there were uh, resources available to Everett, not strangely at all. I think Everett knew this in von Neumann's textbook, Mathematical Foundations and Quantum Mechanics. Um, these were von Neumann's book and uh, David Bohm's book were the two books that were most important to Everett. Um, uh, by his own admission, both of them analyzed the model to the observer explicitly in quantum mechanical terms. Uh, and of course, von Neumann had quite an elaborate set of machinery for treating um, the classical uh, or quasi classical systems, um, analyzing the macroscopic in terms of well localized states in phase space. Okay, so, uh, so anyway, classical concepts derived, and this all became much more explicit than Digger history, uh, derived rather than assumed. Um, decoherence in ordinary matter at ordinary temperatures is extremely rapid, even at molecular uh, dimensions. Um, and if also decoherence is general theory of branching in Everett's sense, giving rise to different forms of matter, then uh, I've done it again. But I, I just press start. Next. Okay, good. Uh, then, oh, I seem to have lost my conclusion. Then uh, branching is ubiquitous, pervasive. Uh, happening all the time. Okay, so that's the, the one of the main messages needed from decoherence theory to get my talk now off the ground. Um, so there is an issue about uh, uh, the connections with. Um, I can just. Oh, I see what happened. I got a slide out of order. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So well, there was my conclusion, branching in every sense in ordinary matter at ordinary temperatures is pervasive, vast, and ubiquitous. Um, I did want to make a comment about uh, the relationship between the decoherent mistress approach and um, so-called environmental decoherence, and in particular the derivation of master equations that we all know and love, the Yasse equation, the caldera legate equation, and so forth. Um, so, uh, it's not entirely obvious how those things are to be, to be married, but um, I do have this nice quotation um, from uh, Klaus Kiefer, and I was very much hoping he would be here today, so that he could fend off um, uh, negative views on, on this claim. Uh, but the claim is um, that uh, in the presence of decoherence, the language of consistent histories may be conveniently employed to describe the situation and moreover that it can provide technical advantages. Um, so that's, I think, an important uh, claim to make, but I think one that I have yet to really validate entirely to my own satisfaction. 
Um, uh, notice also this other point. Uh, the class of consistent histories is much larger than the class which exhibits quasi-classical behavior. Indeed. So what I'm really interested in in decaying history theory is not the mere idea of consistency, but more the idea of a quasi-classical domain in Gelman and Hartle's sense. Now, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. <clears throat> um, so let me go to uh, the old branch counting rule, because this talk is all about branch counting. So this came up in Neil Graham's uh, thesis, PhD thesis written under DeWitt, uh, a part of which was published in the DeWitt and Graham Many Worlds volume. Um, and he raised it as a problem, an objection to Everett's analysis of probability, which he, Graham, thought he would be able to answer. But unfortunately, uh, everyone remembered the criticism without really remembering what his answer to it was. So uh, in many ways, this did a great deal of damage to the um, credibility of the Everett interpretation. Uh, so the problem being that if you count branches, um, and these are non-zero amplitude branches, uh, then uh, you always get as the relative numbers of branches for, say, a, a two-outcome experiment, uh, you always get that the vast majority of branches will have relative frequencies one-half, regardless of the amplitudes. <clears throat> so this seemed a really a rather fatal um, criticism. Uh, actually, um, there is a lot wrong with this branch counting rule. Um, I don't know who was the first to point it out, but I first learned it from David Wallace. Um, that there's a built-in instability to it, which comes to light as soon as you have different experiments going on in different branches. So, the, you look at a, a, a tails and heads outcome. Um, the, there's a second measurement made in one branch but not in the other, whereby that's, that, that first branch, this one here, this one, bifurcates again. So, it doesn't matter what you're measuring, it's something totally unrelated um, to, to uh, coin tosses. Uh, but now, after you've made that second measurement in one branch, how many branches are there with the outcome heads? And the answer is there's two out of three, so now it seems the probability is two-thirds. Whereas before you made that second measurement, the probability was one-half. So there's an instability in the probabilities computed by this rule. Um, which you might say, oh, that's all the more then that's wrong with the Everett interpretation. But I think one has to um, have some... Uh, attempt, anyway, in philosophy we do this all the time, uh, charitable interpretations. Um, if you find a very bad interpretation or way of reading uh, an analysis, uh, is there a better one? That ought to be the question. So if this is a very bad way of interpreting the state in terms of probability, it, the question becomes, is there a better one? Um, anyway, let me uh, just distinguish two versions of the branch counting rule as a result of this instability problem. Um, one is the global, global branch counting, which is the one I just used, and that's the one that's unstable. But there is a local branch counting rule, only count the numbers uh, produced at each given experiment, count those as equiprobable. Right. And that is not subject to the same, same instability rule, so Wallace's critique does not go through. Um, but the critique that does go through, in this case, um, is that these branch numbers and the probabilities thus computed are a discontinuous function of the state. So you can tweak the state ever so much and the relative frequencies determined by the non-zero amplitude branches uh, can vary arbitrarily um, and arbitrarily large. So it's, uh, in, in, for a variety of reasons, it's not a good way of interpreting the state. Um, so what do we make of then branch counting overall? I mean, this is uh, the way David put it, but um, David, I, I actually said many similar things myself earlier. Um, so the claim is that ultimately the question how many branches are there does not really make sense if you work with decoherence theory. Um, it's the decoherence is something that is rather, uh, let me not say vague, but it's not precisely defined. Uh, it comes in degrees. Uh, when do you propose that there is a cutoff to determine, uh, in decoherent history theory, for example, what is the fine, the fine uh, graining that you use in order to determine branch number? There's no definite number, it seems, that one can arrive at. Um, so I was reminded, uh, my wife just recently we were in the glorious Tuscany uh, countryside, and she asked, how many shades of green are there? And of course the answer is, 
uh, really rather indeterminate. One can't say how many shades of green there is. And this was a popular answer by people like myself and David Wallace and others who base Everett interpretation on decoherence theory that there is no such thing as branch number. But I came to reconsider this, and my talk is about a reconsideration of this. Um, and it's not as though we haven't uh, before encountered something like this. Um, take the classical state. Uh, so the classical state, if it's a point in phase space, you know, the question how many classical states are there, classical microstates are there to a gas or something, it would seem as either a continuum infinity or it has no answer. But actually we have a uh, precursor here, um, and a rather important one, which did make sense of microstate numbers. Uh, and this was introduced by Boltzmann in his series of papers in the, in the 1870s. Um, uh, so what he did was introduce a fine graining on phase space, uh, choose a unit, Tor, some, uh, I'll just, whoops, let me see, I'm just going to, sorry, where are we? Yeah, here we are. So choose this unit, Tor, uh, smaller than the accessible phase space volume, um, Define the fine graining uh, and then count microstates in terms of the numbers of particles in these fine grained cells on phase space. And in that way, he arrived uh, at uh, expressions like this, which I hope we all know and love. Um, elementary statistical mechanics, we encounter this all the time. So uh, here, here's just for some system with uh, finitely many energies. Uh, each of them non-degenerate. If you've got degeneracy ZS, uh, then you've got this factor here, and then this is accounting for the various ways that you assign, uh, the, uh, the, you select the N1, N2, dot, 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 NS numbers out of the total N. Uh, so that's that combinatoric expression. So these are rather important combinatoric expressions. Maximizing them then yields the equilibrium entropy. Okay, so I've got a constant proportionality in there because the point is you're really comparing different numbers of ways of achieving the same occupation numbers <coughs> uh, and uh, there's an overall normalization which is then just drops out, cancels out, or dividing one by the other. Right, that's also going to be important later. All right, so uh, to make the connection with quantum mechanics and in particular quantum measurements as opposed to equilibrium in states of gases, uh, we need a bit more. So here I'm giving you the basics of probability on a classical history space. Um, if you've not seen this sort of thing before, it may be a bit much to quickly take it in. But I don't really have the time to go through it in detail. I hope you can sort of figure it out. I mean, this part is straightforward. It's just the Bayes measure. Um, but this is Lebesge measure weighted by some classical probability distribution, uh, and one can define a history assignment of non null events, uh, partitioning of the phase space. We, before we had that into this fine graining that I was talking about, uh, the Boltzmann used with these equal, equal uh, phase space volumes. Um, I've got projectors in here, this is classical theory, so you might worry well, what on earth the projectors doing, but it's just given a simple expression like this, it's a mapping of functions. Uh, and one then has expressions for the probabilities of a history, given the classical distribution f, and here I'm putting it into a summary form. Um, oh, and I want to say uh, that it has the consequence when h and h prime are disjoint, that the probability for their union is just the sum. So it follows automatically because this expression is linear uh, in CH. Uh, when we go to quantum history space, um, the structure is extremely similar. One replaces the Bayes measure by the trace. Um, of course, for infinite dimensions, projections of infinite dimensional, uh, of infinite dimensions, which most of them will be in decoherence theory, um, that is not very informative. Uh, but given a state, one then has the uh, analog of this expression. You have the history, you have a partitioning, uh, now we have projection operators on Hilbert space, and one has similar expressions here in the classical case. The difference is that when you look at the uh, probability density given the state, it's bilinear in the, uh, these uh, uh, so-called class operators or chain operators that are often called, um, and as a result, you no longer have additivity. Okay, when h and h prime are disjoint, it no longer follows that the probability is the sum. Okay, so let me 
fix that, so you go to a decoherent history space and then you do have that additivity requirement, so you have a well-defined probability measure of histories, and, and then specifically a quasi-classical domain is a quantum history space where the, the, the fine-grained histories satisfy definite equations. Okay, so that's the important distinction between the quasi-classical domain and merely a, a, a decoherent history space. The Dampering came to the famous uh, a series of papers, one in particular in the mid-90s, had a fairly devastating critique of the consistent equals decoherent histories approach. Because you can deform these decoherent history spaces arbitrarily whilst maintaining consistency. So you've got a continuum and infinity of different history spaces. It's a kind of indeterminism, not so different from the whole argument that Jeremy spoke about yesterday. But nothing like that applies to a quasi-classical domain. Um, so, in order to understand what this really means here, this expression, when you're writing out the total state in terms of a sum over histories, the superposition of states that result in this way, applying these history operators. So, I've written out the state just schematically, so you can sort of see the, the, the nature of the, uh, the, the structure. I go from phi A to phi B, you know, to phi C. Those A, Bs, and Cs are indicating the values of uh, some parameter space that's involved in the, the fine gradient uh, satisfy some equation. Uh, likewise, phi D, phi E, phi F, they satisfy some equation. It's by virtue of satisfying those equations that it's appropriate to say that the quantum state has this structure at all. Because otherwise, you know, why, why I think there's a multiplicity there? Um, you can express the state in terms of any basis you want. What does it mean? So what was happening in Emmett's original work is that these equations, the A, B, C's, that what, the, what that was then satisfying were his measurement protocols. <clears throat> okay, so he had a set of protocols, the system performs a measurement, records the value, sticks it in memory, refreshes, and goes on to the next measurement. That's a series of, of steps taken by the apparatus, and those were, in effect, the equations for the branches. But of course, those, those equations, call them equations, those protocols, they were just made up, you know, they were just made much. So it seemed to many that it's people who mostly don't like these ideas, it seems it's quite pervasive to dislike the Yerrit interpretation on the basis of the multiplicity of worlds, which is interesting, and I, I've not really got to the bottom of it. I myself don't love it, but I don't hate it either. Um, but anyway, so for most of his critics, it seemed that there was just no, nothing concrete in this. Actually, Everett did somewhat better, but only in his so-called long dissertation, the long, the long thesis that was published in the 73 volume, but much less well read, where he sketched how, in fact, one could obtain these rules here would be the rules of classical mechanics. Okay, it's only a sketch of the proof, and it, it, it depended heavily on von Neumann's ideas. Okay, so here's my point about master equations in quantum mechanics. Can they really be put uh, in, in this form, we can express them in terms of a quasi-classical domain, uh, and that's something that I would, if anybody here has any views, ideas, criticisms, doubts, <laughs> hopes, uh, please come and approach me, I would like to, to share them. Um, I do think there's unfinished business here. <clears throat> okay, so now on to the new branch, branch, branch counting rule. The point is to mimic what Boltzmann did. And I introduced the apparatus, the, some of the details of the machinery of decoherent history spaces, so you can see how one can talk about histories as sequences of, of uh, regions of phase space. Okay, so one can define um, uh, histories of over phase space as uh, sequences of projection operators. Uh, again, this is a construction of the moment's book. Anyway, so here I've got the uh, branch states uh, produced uh, at the termination of a, a history H uh, with n steps in time. This is all involving a discretization in time. Uh, choose a unit. This is what Boltzmann did after all. Choose a volume measure on phase space. Choose a fine graining such that all of the cells have the same volume. I'm choosing a measure, uh, sorry, a unit. Uh, which has got to be much less than the normal psi, and a fine graining on the on phase space, let's stick with phase space, um, such that the amplitudes are all the same. Okay. So let the H go coarse graining of this parameter space, phase space. Then we have this uh, 
this follows independence of the decoherence, so it's rather a beautiful property of these chain operators. So you can ask then how many fine-grained histories are there for each H? The ratio in those numbers then gives the relative probabilities. Okay, so to see that um, this just follows from decoherence, okay, that's additivity, remember? <coughs> Um, and by construction, each of these is omega squared. Uh, so if there are nh terms in this sum, and nh primed for the coarse grained history h primed, then look at their ratio, it's equal to this thing, which is just equal to this thing for h divided by the same thing for h primed. Choose h primed as the identity, and we obtain the Born rule. So the, uh, so the entire proof, as it were, is up on this slide. And let me just simplify it a little bit, just in case it's not blindingly obvious. So uh, here I've simplified somewhat. Just look at the states uh, as a superposition of states uh, at time tn. Each of these has different amplitude. Uh, sorry, each of these has the same amplitude. So count the numbers with outcome h. Count the numbers with outcome h primed. Uh, there's R and of the one, S of the other, so the probability is just the ratio. <coughs> Very important here, of course, that these states are orthogonal, mm. okay, and they're good altitude. Um, so going back to microstates, uh, Boltzmann's microstate counting rule, I think the crucial question is, is this really following what Boltzmann did? It doesn't have to. But for the skeptic who sees this as something contrived or ad hoc or whatever, uh, I think the argument that, look, it's what Boltzmann did ought to be pretty compelling. I and mean, it's hard to make out that it's ad hoc when it's what uh, Boltzmann did. But actually, uh, what, uh, I'll come on to this in a minute, what started quantum mechanics? So one really needs to go back and look at these parallels uh, look at this business of choosing a partition. Now, what Boltzmann did was that, in effect, he chose F to be a uniform measure. So, therefore, the cells of equal Lebesgue measure were the same as cells of the weighted measure, weighted by the classical probability distribution. Here, we're doing the same but weighted by a state psi, we're choosing the partitioning. And if we had a uniform measure, then it really would come back to the, the trace in the way that this came back to the Lebesgue measure. Right? But typically in a measurement situation, we don't have a uniform measure, there's no reason to suppose so, so you use the actual state. That's the thing. So I think the justification for what I'm doing all rests on this slide. But now if I can quickly go through some of the connections between this branch counting rule and other topics in probability. Uh, one is the language difficulty business that was, uh, came up with uh, Everett's own work. He had this famous footnote when he talked about it. Here's Reeves talking about it. We should speak of the altitude square measure as a measure of, exi of existence. This is Faber and Ed Feidman, for example. Uh, he's, Hillary is saying that it's somewhat appropriate we should say instead that there is less of them, being real is an all or nothing affair, she correctly says, but we should say that there is less of them. It's not grammatical. There are not less of them, there are fewer of them, and we only have the ratios. Okay. So a crucial point, or something I should have mentioned, of course, is that these ratios that I'm getting out are independent of the size of the unit of amplitude that I'm speaking, as long as that unit is small. <coughs> um, Personal identity. Look, I, I, I'll skip this because I'm running out of time. Uh, the discovery of the quantum, the point about what Boltzmann's technique gave, it also gave us the, uh, ultimately the Planck distribution. Planck himself was led to this expression through reading Boltzmann's work, so it was led to the discovery of the quantum. So it can hardly be called ad hoc if it had that consequence. Um, so decision theory, let me just quickly say something for the, on decision theory, and I hope I still have time, five minutes for questions. Um, so this is a di dialogue with David Deutsch. So, um, naive person, why did we just see an interference pattern? Uh, not all, this is me, not all of us in the multiverse did, only most of us did, because that's the immediate consequence of the branch counting rule. The relative numbers of branches give the uh, probabilities. So, 
So why should I expect to be among that majority? They can't all be equally likely they all exist. And say, yes, indeed, you should expect to be the among, among the majority because not expecting it, it is irrational. Naive person, should I always expect to be in a majority? Simon, by no means always, but you should expect it in this situation. Naive person, why should I expect it? I say, ask Deutsch. Deutsch gives the answer. Naive person, okay, I'm totally convinced, but the argument that convinced me doesn't make any reference to my being in a majority. That makes me very uneasy. Uh, and then there's the issue, well, suppose you had been convinced, but I told you that contrary to your rational expectation, the overwhelming majority of you didn't see the interference pattern. Naive person, I expect you're using a perverse method of counting, to which I say, which implies that there exists a non-perverse method that says the majority did see it. Naive person, yes, if there isn't, something's wrong, and that I have good news. So this is David's take on what I'm doing, but I think he's five minutes now, oh four. <laughs> but uh, I think he's just mistaken. Uh, if you look at his own work on the decision theory argument, you see that branch counting absolutely, echo amplitude branch counting is absolutely central to the entire decision theoretic uh, move. Okay, in a way, what the Wallace's <coughs> is actually is doing, which is much clearer, is it makes it rational for an agent to have equal preference between one computer, one quantum game, whatever, as various outcomes, various amplitudes, and another quantum game in which you've carefully engineered things using ancillary apparatuses and so forth in order to produce observably distinct equi-amplitude branches, whereupon the symmetry argument applies and the rationality argument kicks in. But the point is, these equi-amplitude branches exist anyway. You don't, they don't have to be made observable, as it were. Right, well, I think I'm running out of time. So um, I did want to say something about frequentism, because this is a form of frequentism. The philosophy of probabilityism has a very long history, 200 years, of absolute confusion uh, as to what probability could be, uh, something that philosophers worry about rather more than physicists do. Um, and frequentism has always been the sort of fallback position for the typical scientist. This is a form of frequentism that really works. None of these criticisms apply. The, um, the ensemble, the collection that one's looking at uh, in the frequentism, is spread across the worlds rather than in a single world, and that makes all the difference. Okay, I'll conclude with that. I did want to just have a, a little look at Einstein. It's my great sadness that he died before ever it was published in his work, uh, and I would wish that he knew uh, what to make, what he would have made of it. But I'm quite sure he would have concluded that God does not play with dice. <laughs> right? Thank you. dynamically explains the collapse of the wave function and derives the bond probability rule from first principles would seem to be something much simpler than trying to explain probabilities in average. What, in your opinion, would be a definitive theoretical or experimental result which would force everything to give up many words? You want, you want to know what that would force me to give up many yes, words? Yes, yes. Oh. Anything that would make me forced to give up quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Emerson interpretation is just look, examine the unitary evolution of the quantum state for systems with reasonably complication and thermal environments and so forth. There is a branching structure to it, and as I've just shown, there is also a relative frequency structure to it. I don't think you can get much simpler uh, as an answer as to what probability is than relative frequencies. The problem is that that answer has never worked before, but it does in Emerson. Uh, am I correct in saying that uh, the unit you're using uh, to divide up the world uh, will have to become smaller with time as there are more and more branches? Absolutely, and... absolutely. The amplitude is being driven down exponentially fast in the amplitude interpretation. I and mean, I think this is something that's often neglected. And one would be better to think of amplitude 
there's more something like a cyclical thing that is just going round and round, you know, rather than as a quantity that is going down and down to zero. Intuitive issues. But yeah, of course, the amplitude is going down all the time. But it's the relative amplitudes that matter. So, um, but if we're trying to count as in a discrete number of branches, then doesn't that mean we have to use a fixed unit that doesn't decrease with time? No, not at all. I mean, at any time, choose your unit, small in comparison to the amplitude of the state. Look at the branching structure, look at the relative numbers, look at the ratios, the unit cancels out. Those ratios agree with the Born rule to within that unit. Not probabilistically, it's not that probably the relative numbers agree with the Born rule quantities. They absolutely agree with the Born rule quantities, but up to that unit. So choose that unit small in terms of the amplitude. What would be nice is to take it to zero, which was what Boltzmann advocated, but you can't take it to zero in the 10 units. Okay, same So your argument um, seems to rely on. Uh, Picking this unit and then a set of uh, a quasi classical domain or decoherent histories where the amplitudes are equal for the different histories. Yes. But if you start with a different state, you pick those for a particular state so the amplitudes are equal, and then you start with another state, they won't be equal anymore. No, of course. And you pick a different history, you pick a different unit. What we're trying to do is to see a structure to the quantum state, to interpret it in probabilistic terms. And here's how to do it pick a unit, look at the number of branches. The statistics using the one. So the branching, the branching is initial state dependent. Right? Of course. How could it not be? Well, I think the argument that Lisa Gellman and Harvard all argument about quasi-classical uh, uh, domains is is uh, ought to work quite well for a variety of different states. The quasi-classical, yeah, the quasi-classical domain may yeah. be well defined for a variety of different states, absolutely, but that doesn't mean that the uh, the structure of the state is the same. No. no. The amplitude is different. Okay, so I think we have to go on now. Uh, thanks, Mr. Peter. Yeah.